Uh, welcome back. So this is uh, lecture number nine. We're going to talk about um, uh, classifiers, okay, classification methods. So uh, let me give you a, a rough idea of what we are going to do in the following uh, few lectures. So this is sort of a, like a like a um, like a road map of the things that uh, we are going to study. Uh, for the classification methods. All right, so now if you look at this diagram here, in this diagram, you can see that um, uh, we are under the, the topic of linear discriminant analysis. It's called a linear analysis because last time we talked about different deep features and we, we sort of understand that no matter what you do with a deep neural network at the last layer, it, it, the features, they, they are kind of linear with respect to your classifier. So uh, for the following uh, weeks, we are going to learn about uh, different classification methods. Um, uh, most of these uh, would be fairly uh, familiar to you in terms of the names, okay? So we want to um, understand the principles, again, draw a lot of pictures, uh, understand the geometry, and then try to understand the connectivity between different methods. So under this big umbrella called the linear discriminant analysis, I am going to separate them into two different classes of methods. One branch is called the generative method, and then the other one is called the discriminative method. I want to separate them because they really belong to different classes of uh, methods. In the generative approach, what you are going to do is that you will look at the data points, and then you will come up with a model. For example, it could be a Gaussian model, then you will learn the parameters of the Gaussian model, and then you are going to make the decision based on the model. So it's called a generative because you are generating the data from certain model. There is an alternative approach, it's called the discriminative approach. The discriminative approach does not need to know the underlying model parameters. What you are going to do is that you are going to directly find a classifier that separates the two classes of data points. That's called the, the, the discriminative methods. In the generative uh, methods, the thing that we are going to spend time on is called the Bayesian decision rules. So you will learn about uh, what do I mean by high dimensional Gaussian, how do we estimate the mean, how do we estimate the variance, and given the mean and given the variance, how are you going to construct the decision boundary. For the discriminant uh, methods, you are going to learn logistic regression, a term probably you have heard before, uh, support vector machines, another term that you have probably heard before, and neural networks, okay? A very, very popular uh, techniques nowadays. Okay, so um, the, we, the following five lectures, uh, we will spend time on first the generative methods because they are more statistical. They are slightly easier to understand, uh, and then they have a lot of uh, interpret interpretation that you can draw from the results. All right, so what is a generative approach? I have just described that you need to construct a model. So the goal is that you want to construct a discriminant function g equals to w transpose x plus w0, that's a linear classifier, where w is your, your normal vector and w0 is the offset. Um, so this is a discriminant function. You want to construct a model using these two quantities. Uh, one is called the likelihood function. The other one is called the prior distribution. You're going to use these two terminologies. And well, we are going to focus mainly on the Gaussian distribution because this is a little bit easier to deal with. So what you will do is that I will give you some data points x and then you need to find out the class mean and the class covariance matrix. From there, uh, we are going to construct a W and W0 for the two classes. Now, I want to make it uh, also clear that uh, for the remaining few weeks, we are going to study two class classification. Okay, very simple, binary classification, one versus zero. Uh, we can easily extend the idea to multiple classes, uh, but then, uh, we will do it later, okay? So for the remaining lectures, we will spend most of our time talking about um, binary classifications. Okay, so uh, what are we going to talk about today? 
uh, we want to talk about Bayesian decision rules. There are three uh, components that we want to um, talk about. One is that I want to spend some time uh, reviewing uh, the basic ideas of high dimensional Gaussians. Uh, that include the notion of likelihood function and also the prior distribution. And then I want to talk about the meaning of the Gaussian PDF. And afterwards, uh, we want to spend some time understanding the basics of this Bayesian decision rule. How we can use the likelihood function and also the prior distribution to construct a, a decision boundary. I want to illustrate this uh, problem using a 1D example. And then for the remaining time, let's see how much time we will have. I want to jump into uh, three cases of the Gaussian problem. Uh, the first case will uh, say that where the two, two Gaussians, they share the same uh, covariance matrix. In addition, they, they are very simple in structure. And then there are two additional cases that we will uh, go over in next lecture. So uh, let's first talk about uh, high dimensional Gaussians. Uh, this is a like a review of uh, an undergraduate probability course. So um, uh, we are going to define a d-dimensional Gaussian um, probability density function, the PDF, as this equation. Okay, so this probability density function tells you that if you integrate uh, this density function over a certain range of the x, you are going to get the probability that the, the, the random variable x lives in that uh, range. So in this PDF, you can see that uh, I have uh, two variables. Uh, one is the x, uh, one is the mu, the other one is the sigma inverse. Okay, so uh, mu is called the mean vector. And the mean vector, of course, uh, your x is a vector, and so the mean vector would be a vector of the individual expectations. Okay, so here the x, they are the random variables, and since you have a d-dimensional random variable, you have a, you have an array of a d random variables here, and so you can take the in expectation of individual elements that will give you this mean vector. Uh, the matrix sigma here is called the covariance matrix. It has a structure like this. You have the variance along the diagonal, and then you have the covariance uh, entries along the off diagonals. The dimensionality of this sigma matrix is d by d, where d is the number of elements in your vector x. Okay, so this sigma matrix is, al is always positive semi-definite. Okay, why? Well, it's because that you're taking the inner product of these, uh, you're taking the outer product of these two vectors, and uh, through the construction, you can see that this, this outer product is always going to give you a positive semi-definite matrix. Now, you can also uh, see from this picture here, where you have the variance, okay, and um, uh, uh, since this is positive semi-definite, uh, when you put down the elements into this matrix, you can you you can sort of check whether your uh, your eigenvalues they are positive or not. Okay, if there's anything that goes wrong, then this matrix, if you don't calculate properly, then this matrix may not be positive semi-definite, and then some you know that something is wrong. Okay, there is a special case of the uh, covariance matrix, which is the diagonal covariance. And in this case, uh, you assume that the covariance between the i and the j random variables, they are zero. And if that happens, your covariance matrix can be written as a diagonal matrix with elements just living on the diagonal. And since they are the variance of your variables, you just have sigma 1 square through sigma d square. When this happens, your exponential, so, 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 so remember that the, the, the Gaussian that you have, uh, is taking exponential of some term. Uh, if this, uh, covariance matrix is really a diagonal matrix, then you can show that the exponential will take this form. Uh, if you plug in the diagonal elements into the sigma, uh, matrix, then you will get this uh, summation of all the individual sum squares divided by the, uh, the sigma square. If you expand it out, you can show that the, co the, the probability density function is written as a product of all these uh, individual elements. All right. 
So now what is the meaning of having a diagonal matrix? It means that all these uh, uh, x1 and xj, they are, they are independent. Okay, so when they're independent, you can have the diagonal matrix, and once you have the diagonal matrix, you can, you can, you can, you can write them into a product. So that would simplify the calculation significantly. Um, a pictorial illustration of a high dimensional Gaussian can be uh, seen through a 2D uh, plot. In this diagram, I am showing you a, uh, a set of data points that are drawn from a distribution, it's a two-dimensional Gaussian, with a mean vector of 0, 0. Okay, so here is the center, that's the mean vector. And then it has a covariance matrix given by these four elements. Uh, so uh, you realize that uh, the, the main diagonals, okay, they are 0 0.25 and 1. If they are really 0, then you get a, uh, a Gaussian which is uh, uh, a horizontal or vertical. If uh, you do not, you do not have the 0 0.3 here. Uh, because you have the 0 0.3, you have the off diagonal elements, you are going to rotate your Gaussian uh, PDF. Now, the meaning of this mu vector is that you are going to shift it to, to the left or to the right, up and down. So that's the interpretation of the mean vector. The orientation, the angle is given by, uh, the, the, the four elements here. Now, if you want to be slightly even more precise, what is the dominant direction here? Uh, that would be your principal uh, component. So you run the you run the eigen decomposition on this matrix, then you get the leading eigenvector. That would be your major direction, and then the orthogonal direction would be your um, uh, would, would be the minor axis. And also the eigenvalues they will measure the, the the radius or the spread of um, of the samples along these two axes. Now I am going to define three terms that you again should have uh, heard before. Suppose I have a set of data points x1 through xn and then they are in classes uh, 1 through k. Uh, in our case, uh, again, the, the class will either be 0 or 1. Okay, so we are looking at binary classification and so the number of classes will just be two classes. Um, I am defining three terms. The first one is called the likelihood function. The likelihood function should be the data point uh, conditioned on the class. So I am in class one, so then the likelihood function will be what is the probability of getting this observation given that the data point comes from class one. Imagine that you have uh, two Gaussians, okay? This is C1, this is C2. C1, you have certain mean and certain covariance. C2, you have another mean, another covariance. Uh, so when I say that uh, I'm looking at the likelihood function of p uh, x given y and y is 1, then I really don't really mean that I'm going to draw a sample according to class 1's mean and covariance. The prior distribution is the, um, is the probability of drawing a class. Now, uh, the prior has nothing to do with your data point. Even without a data point, you already have the prior distribution. That could be something more subjective. You may say that I am looking at an image and uh, uh, for 70% for of the time, I will get the buildings and only 30% of the time, I will get a, a person. Okay, That's just the prior probability that, that you know beforehand uh, that is likely to happen according to the prior experience. So that is the prior distribution. Now, when you multiply the two together, that will give you the posterior, okay? So the posterior distribution is that the, what is the probability of getting class, class i, uh, given that you have observed the data point x, okay? So that's a reverse direction, uh, with respect to your likelihood. The likelihood says that given that you are in class k, what is the probability of getting, uh, sample x? This one says that now I have already seen x, what is the probability that it actually comes from the class X, class K? Now the two, they are related by the products, okay? So if you take these two together, take the product of these two, uh, you are going to get the intersection, and then if you divide it by the total probability, then you can get the posterior. That's called the Bayes theorem. And you can also expand uh, this Px by using the law of total probability, which would be the sum of the individual uh, products. All right. 
So these are the terminologies. So now let me give you a very quick example. Suppose you have two Gaussians. The first Gaussian has a parameter set of mu1 and sigma1. The other one has mu2 and sigma2. Uh, and also assume that the prior distribution of the two classes are pi1 and pi2 respectively. All right. Uh, if you want them to be fair, then it would be one half and then one half. But but that's not necessary. You can have pi one and pi two as long as pi one plus pi two equals to one. You are good. Okay. So what is the likelihood function? Well, the likelihood function, of course, it depends on which class you are at. Suppose you are at class one, then you will draw a Gaussian PDF according to one. That means you are going to use mu one and sigma one for the class that you are conditioned on. Uh, the posterior distribution, according to the base theorem, you can write it as the product of the likelihood times the prior divided by the total probability. So uh, here you have a denominator and also a numerator. The numerator will literally be the um, the product of your 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 likelihood function in your prior. Okay. Now, how about the denominator? The denominator will be again this product. However, you need to sum over all the possible uh, classes. That's called the law of total probability. Okay? So that will give you the, the posterior distribution of the class. Um, in doing the classification uh, problem, we are not uh, happy with this, uh, this expression that involves all the exponentials uh, because they're just hard to deal with. And so um, we tend to work in the negative log domain. And by negative log domain, I mean that you put a negative log to the likelihood function. And so once you put a negative log to this uh, PDF here, you realize that uh, the negative log will have an action to the constant. And then it will have an action to the exponential. So when you apply the log to this one, then you will get uh, this constant here. You have, this is not n, this is d. So you have uh, minus d over 2, and then log 2 pi, and minus uh, 1 half log, uh, and then this is the uh, determinant of your, your sigma k. And then once you apply the negative log to the exponential, you will squeeze out this, uh, this exponential term, which is 1 half, and then there's a quadratic equation here. Now realize that the first term will contain x. The second half actually does not contain any x. So when you try to make a decision, uh, the decision has to be based on the x, then in many, many cases, this term can be dropped. Now it's not always, as we, will, we are going to see, uh, depending on the situation, but if uh, for some problems where the sigma k is the same for all the classes, then you can just drop this term. Uh, this quantity, since it is a quadratic equation, and we have shown that the sigma matrix is positive semi-definite, then we can guarantee that this, um, this quadratic quantity is non-negative. It's always true. And then if we take the square roots, it's called the Mahalanobis distance. It's a measure in the, in the distributional space.